Bob, as you know, is President and Chief Executive Officer of Spirit Airlines. And I'm sure you also know that Spirit is the largest ultra-low cost carrier in the United States. They operate 400 daily flights to 59 destinations in the US, Latin America, and the Caribbean. And I'm very pleased they've just added Hartford to their list of destinations and will be flying out of there in, uh, starting in April. Bob has more than 35 years of marketing, planning, finance, and management experience in the airline industry. Uh, and in fact, he started his career in the airline industry right here in New York. Prior to his appointment at Spirit, Bob was president of Parkview Partners, a transportation and travel industry advisory firm. In 2011, Bob retired as chairman, CEO, and president of AirTran Holdings. Obviously, he only temporarily retired. During his tenure at AirTran, the airline experienced a seven-fold increase in revenues, growing to nearly $3 billion. And prior to AirTran, Bob was Senior Vice President Planning at US Airways, and before that, he was Senior Vice President Marketing Planning at Northwest, uh, and here in New York, he was with TWA. Bob last spoke here at the Wings Club in 2009 when he was with AirTran. It is our pleasure to welcome him back in his latest role at Spirit. Please join me in welcoming Bob Fernandez. Thanks very much. You know, there's a number of people from the Spirit team. Um, so I won't introduce all of them, but I will ask uh, our chairman of the board, Matt Gardner, to stand up. Uh, Mac, uh, he's close by and he's got the leash just in case uh, we need it. Um, we, did think it uh, we did think about uh, the tickets, so we are going to give two tickets, but we've decided to include free bags with it. It's not something we normally do. Um, so so you, can, you can spend that money at your next destination. So um, again, it's great to be back in New York and uh, again, to see many old friends. Uh, uh, I've, I've worked with a number of people in this room and it's, it's glad to see you all again. And again, I last spoke at the Wings Club in early 2009 when I was chairman and CEO of AirTran Airways. And you know, that year, the industry was just coming out of the fuel price crisis of 2008 and we were in the depths of the Great Recession. And at that time, several smaller carriers shut down and most of the industry was in the midst of a general restructuring. Only Delta Northwest had been, merger had been completed, but the table was being set at that time for more industry consolidation. And I think it's an understatement to say how much things have changed since 2009. Back in 2009, I spent much of my time talking about the industry's efforts to rein in excessive speculation and to bring a sense of order to oil markets. So here I am in 2017, and we have oil around $54 a barrel. So it's really a much different time indeed. So today I'll talk about more recent history and issues in the airline industry, and also many developments at Spirit along the way. Again, at 2009, Spirit, Spirit was an irrelevant little airline that was starting to do crazy things like charging people for checked and even carry-on bags. We operated only 28 airplanes, and with all the macro problems facing the industry, other airlines didn't pay much attention to what Spirit was doing. The press and other blogs covered us a bit, pretending to be shocked at our colorful advertising. But most public voices just ridiculed the idea that an a la carte business model would attract more than a tiny fringe of consumers who had no alternative than to travel at other than a rock bottom fare. So while the first true low cost pioneer in the US was Southwest Airlines, Spirit primarily took its page out of the European ULCC playbook. Most people didn't think it would work here, and the conventional thinking at the time was Americans demand extras and they expect them for free. Well since then Spirit has quadrupled its size. From a limited north-south network in the eastern US, we now fly a full network of service to substantially all major markets 
in a nice international operation. We will hit 100 aircraft this quarter. We took the 99 the other day, and you know, what can I say? We fly yellow airplanes. I think they'll look great, by the way. Uh, we are one of the more talked about airlines in the media, and we attract outsized attention from other airlines. That's pretty shocking since we still have only 3% market share in the U.S. today. But we've been a big catalyst for change for, in the intense industry-wide fare matching that's gone on since mid-2015, which, by the way, has saved consumers billions of dollars. So you're welcome. <laughs> now, across-the-board price matching has proven unsustainable for large legacy carriers, so they're rolling out more restricted basic economy products by American and United, um, which have been justified by the big three mainly as, as competitive responses to spirit. I think if you read the trade press, you're seeing a lot about this. In fact, in the Wall Street Journal, a big article as well. So uh, small spirit um, is playing a big role. How flattering, again, compared to how we were perceived just a few years ago. So what happened? It's, I think it's a combination of several factors working together at the macro level, at larger carriers, and at Spirit and ULCCs. First, as we all know, the government permitted several large carriers to merge. So today we have four big airlines controlling 80% of the seats in the domestic U.S. market. Second, because of consolidation and the emergence from restructuring, the remaining airlines are all financially healthy. The last legacy airline emerged from bankruptcy and completed a merger in late 2013. And the sharp drop in fuel prices that began in late 2014 has added massively to already strong airline cash flows. So more head scratching in airline boardrooms. Major airlines are flush with more cash than they know what to do with. Fuel prices are low. And ULCC carriers like Spirit are annoyingly profitable. So what could happen next? And so it all really started in late 2014 with the expiration of the Wright Amendment. And at that time, it set off a large drop in prices in the Dallas market, which eventually spread um, you know, across the nation. And essentially, we have broad brace price matching in all key markets around the country mostly with an overt objective of competing directly with ULCCs and specifically Spirit. And I think this is now the new normal, and it's a big difference from an earlier environment where ULCC fares went largely unmatched. And I think it's going to, go, I think it's going to last for a while, and like I said, I think the consumers should be pretty happy. So is all this sustainable, and how will Spirit evolve? One thing I know for sure is things don't stay the same for long, and oil prices may go higher or stay lower for longer, and the economy may keep muddling along or not. But consumer preferences will continue to evolve. But I think there's some basic rules in our industry, just like there is gravity. I think it's fairly simple. First, price is the most important criteria for most travelers. Another is that costs matter, and therefore I'm certain that ULCCs like Spirit will continue to be resilient in changing competitive environments. Financial stability matters as well, and so Spirit will remain, maintain a strong balance sheet. Finally, service and reliability are also very important. When I became Spirit CEO early last year, I was very impressed with the culture of innovation and cost discipline. I wasn't, frankly, that, that happy at all about the airline that we ran, especially on tough travel days during the summer high season or on bad weather days. But, you know, I used to run an airline that at that time was the industry's low-cost producer, but we also ran a pretty good operation when it came to on-time performance and customer service. In fact, from 2004 to 2011, a period of eight years, AirTran was either number one or number two in the air quality ratings seven times. So I knew you could run a low-cost airline that also maintains a high-quality standard. 
So it's no secret that Spirit lagged behind other airlines in some reliability metrics, customer complaints, and customer satisfaction. However, we became a reporting carrier to the DOT in 2015, and our operating metrics were in full view, and we didn't have a good showing. So I arrived too late in early 2016 to make any substantive changes in the first quarter. Um, and so, again, you know, the, the sub-performance continued into early 2016. But by May, I, I knew uh, things would start to improve, and I came up to New York and stuck my neck out with the press explaining how Spirit was going to get better. And I think it's very important you have to declare it before people start doing it. And so over the ensuing year, we've made great strides, especially in the second half, where we improved the, to rank consistently in the middle of the pack, nearly 80% on time. We also have reduced our DOT complaints by over 60% and are continuing to push those lower. So our focus now is to ensure spirit continues to improve, because I know everybody else will too, and so it's not good enough to stand still. So we are in the early stages of our journey to improve our service. And we're going to continue to grow. We'll finish the year at 110 airplanes, and we're going to compete as well. For us, our goal is to find the right balance where we can continue to be the price leader and also provide a high quality, reliable, and friendly product. Just to touch on a few other issues. Uh, while airfares are generally quite low by historical standards, some markets are much more competitive than others. And most of the difference comes down to the lack of competitive airport access in major markets. There are many consumers out there who can't get access to low fares because Spirit and other ultra-low cost carriers aren't able to establish meaningful presence in some of our nation's biggest airports. Think New York, Chicago, LA, among others. There are, of course, hundreds of other important cities in the US, but a huge percentage of daily flyers are either visiting or originating from one of those large urban areas. In our view, real estate and related rights in major airports are scarce public assets that need to be allocated fairly among legacy carriers and new entrants. That allocation needs to be monitored and adjusted as carriers evolve to make sure facilities are used efficiently and the traveling public benefits from competitive pricing and a diversity of air service. Again, unfortunately, this hasn't happened. Large carriers jealously guard real estate holdings and employ various opaque but effective tactics to stifle competition and minimize new entry. The government seems to have shied away from any meaningful reform effort. Major carriers are able to hold on to the key airport assets as they went through bankruptcies, and the government's required only trivial divestitures of airport assets as a condition of approving those mergers. Airport minimum usage requirements remain scandalously low and are often unsupervised, so it's easy for inefficient carriers to hold on to their positions without fear of losing those gates to their competitors. The result is that major airlines, usually one or two of them, dominate market share and can maintain high prices <clears throat> in, in most of our country's key markets. We urge the federal government and local governments who own and operate these airports to push harder for competitive access, increase choice for consumers, and low fares. No doubt you've been hearing that the legacy carriers have been begging the government to shut out some foreign airlines that are starting to serve the US. I won't get too far into this running debate, but again, it just comes down to whether major U.S. carriers should be protected from competition, or stated differently, whether U.S. consumers should be forced to pay more when competitors are excluded. There are perfectly adequate existing procedures to deal with unfair advantages, and it doesn't make much sense to risk the favorable and reciprocal terms we enjoy by blowing up open skies treaties. Our country will lose a lot more jobs if we do. So again, we urge the government to support and promote real competition. So one last comment. You know, I don't think it's a stretch to say that people in this room, 
the many people who make and enforce the rules in our industry, and most of the media who cover airlines have not been target customers of Spirit. You know, we understand we're not for everyone. For large uh, corporate accounts or more affluent travelers who can afford a bit more, there are plenty of good options out there. But for many ordinary customers, we and other ULCCs are, are the best or perhaps the only option. The ULCC segment may be small today, about 5% of the market, but the population needs low fares, and, and that market is large and is underserved today. So we are the industry's price leader. Uh, we intend to stay that way. And I make a commitment to that we will continue to improve our customer experience and our operational reliability going forward. And so who knows, maybe someday some of you in this room will give us a shot. But thank you very much. Uh, it's been great to be here today. Thank you. Um, we do have time for a couple of questions, if there are any questions out there. Marie has one here. Uh, hey, Bob. Um, so, uh, you know, AirTran, certainly Southwest, moves lots of connecting passengers. Spirit, not so much. Do you see a change in network structure going forward? I thought they were going to ask easy questions. <laughs> Uh, of course, to save hard structural questions for people who know something about them. Um, you know, if, Steve, if you look at the way we're structured, um, you know, I think there's been a lot of changes in, in just six or seven years. And I think it's, it, you know, we're mostly a point to point airline. And I think if you look at uh, most of the places around the country, you know, the places that where you could build large connecting networks have very few facilities. And I think, uh, you know, spirit, I, I think you have to kind of look at the landscape, and you really can't recreate it. And if we try to, if we try to be something that we're not, I think ultimately um, we won't perform well. I think we're best served um, by capitalizing on high price markets. I think over time our market will look differently because we'll, get, we'll be more concentrated. So over time, where we might have had only two or three flights in the city to Orlando, Fort Lauderdale, um, or perhaps New York, over time you'll see more density in our markets. But it would take a really a radical change from a, a facility standpoint to create a, you know, put Spirit in a position where we'd be connecting, say, 30 to 40 percent of our customers. Hey, Bob. Uh, Joe Zanardi at Stiefel. Good to see you. Hey, Joe. Um, so I think at some point, maybe a few years ago, kind of the strategy of Spirit was to you know, use the cost structure to stimulate demand. And it wasn't so much about um, taking share. Going forward, is that, is that still how you see the, the strategy to use your cost structure to stimulate demand? Or, or is the idea, let's try and get the fare up and see what sort of uh, market share we can compete for? You know, I, I think the, the strategy has fundamentally, you know, remained the same. Um, I think, you know, we're best positioned where we could take large overpriced markets and, and make them even larger. That, that's generally going to be the best position for us. Um, you know, we've had a period of time where we, we've seen multiple years of declining prices. And... Um, we don't necessarily have a renewed emphasis on price. However, oil prices have gone from, you know, basically 28 hours back into the 50s. And at some point, you know, you've, you've got to manage those input costs. So over a, a three-year period of time, our average fare dropped about $35, you know, or around, which is a fairly substantial number. And I think for us, you know, going forward, we need to continue to cost, put it across that, but we, we need to raise our average unit revenues. So I don't, I don't think at the end of the day that the strategies are inconsistent. Our fares today are lower than where they were three years ago. And, and even if, if they eventually go up slightly, they're still dramatically lower than at any point in time before we entered those markets. So I think it's just a matter of, you know, you, you know our cost uh, you know, this year will, will be down you know, flat to 1%. If they were dropping 5 to 8, and maybe we would price differently. But ultimately, our goal is to make a margin and, and to deliver EPS for our shareholders. 
And, and actually, the best way to do that today is it's a combination of growth and slightly raising our average prices in key markets. And one more in the back. <clears throat> Hi, Mike Lavitt from Aviation Week. Um, how, how much are the legacy carriers with their new basic economy fares affecting you? Are you feeling much pain from that? Or? Well, it, um, it, there's a lot of talk about it. Uh, I'm trying to remember what it's called. Sometimes I call it basic economy. Sometimes I can't even sure what it's called anymore. Um, Delta has had this pricing scheme out for, for a couple of years. And, um, and actually, American United are actually launching it now. You would have, with all the conversation about it, you would think they've been doing it for years. Um, but it's, it's too early to tell. Today, what's happening is, is if, if you're in Chicago or you're in Dallas or even in Minneapolis, and you know where we fly, you know the prices are very low, the key markets. So they're already matching our prices. Um, so what they're actually trying to do is find a way to match our prices, but also at the same time try to find a way to keep perhaps yourself from getting that low fare ticket and maybe trying to sell you up. And so it's really in its early stages. Um, and, and while they're doing that, I don't, maybe they think we're just standing still. We're doing things ourselves. Because I can tell you, I know, I know today Spirit runs better than it did two years ago. And we are improving. And I think there's, there's some attributes about Spirit that are actually superior to them. And I think actually we do a, a lot better job in the friendly part of the business as well. And so I think it's a matter of, listen, this, this, you know, Spirit has grown. We have, 100, we have 100 flights a day. I think uh, they've watched what we can do. And so they can't ignore us, and they have to compete with us. But they can't compete seat for seat because our costs are half of theirs. And so we could make money at whatever, at whatever price we charge, and they can't. So they're trying to strike a balance. I think, it's, I think it's a really a normalization of the business. And it tells you that the business has evolved. Because 10 years ago, they would, they would match us um, you know, with every seat on the airplane, and you know how that ended up 10 years ago. It didn't end up very well. So I think they're smart trying to compete with us, but I think actually, uh, you know, again, we have a few positive attributes on our own. And the most important one is our costs are dramatically lower. So no matter what they do, that won't change, and that's fundamentally our advantage.